Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? I want to welcome everyone here at the Rockland Event Center. And then uh, last I checked, there was 150-ish, almost 200 here online. So we're glad you're a part of this. I want to say thanks so much to our um, event co-sponsors. One would be the California Department of Education, as well as UCSF. And we're glad all of you are here to make this a part of your Friday. So a few introductions, a few housekeeping items before we get started. And we'll continue with the morning. First off, um, restrooms are right out this door and are right at the exit sign. And also for those viewing online, if you have any questions or even here, we'll have some time at the end of the presentation for any questions, live questions for our presenters. So if you're online, feel free to chat those in the chat box on the webinar, or you can write those down and be prepared to ask those to our presenters at the very end. Okay, let me go ahead and um, read and introduce to you um, some of our presenters for this morning. Um, first one is Mahima Mirali Daran. And Dr. Mirali Daran is a licensed clinical psychologist with extensive experience providing program management, clinical supervision and training, and psychological care for underserved adults, children's, children and families. She serves as the chief psychology officer at Teatros Incorporated. And Mahima coordinated the school-based clinical training program at the Ann Martin Center in Emeryville and is an instructor and supervisor at Access Institute for Psychological Services and Partnerships for Trauma Recovery. She's the co-founder of Cohere SF, an organizational consulting firm promoting workplace being. Mahima is passionate about equity and mental care, mental health care access. She also serves on the board of the Women's Audio Mission. Would you please welcome um, Dr. Mirali Duran. Next, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Kim Norman. He is um, the UCSF Distinguished Professor of Adolescent and Young Adult Mental Health, uh, UCSF Wheel Institute for Neurosciences, a part of UCS, UCSF, and also the director for the UCSF Young Adult and Family Center, which we learned they call YAFSI. Yeah. Dr. Norman is a distinguished professor at UCSF, as I mentioned, and psychiatrist with over 40 years of experience caring for teens and young adults with complex behavioral issues. In 2004, Dr. Norman founded the Young Adult and Family Center at the University of California, San Francisco, dedicated to creating and disseminating innovative mental health services, including digital health services for adolescents, young adults, and their families. The YASI at UCSF aspires to build a center of national prominence where troubled young people and their families receive the best available clinical care, irrespective of their ability to pay. Would you please welcome Dr. Norman. Also introduce um, one of our presenters this morning, the Executive Director uh, for Wellness Together School Mental Health. His name is Marlon Morgan. And Marlon began his career as a school counselor and a licensed professional clinical counselor, creating and implementing student support systems to identify and provide services for target subgroups in an effort to close the achievement gap. He has received special recognition from the US Congress, California State Senate, and the California State Assembly for his innovative work promoting mental health and wellness and education. In 2016, Marlon was appointed by the California State Superintendent of Public Instruction as a member of the Student Mental Health Policy Workgroup to develop policy recommendations for the SSPI and the California Legislature. Marlon is also an adjunct faculty member at Bramman University and the Marriage and Family Therapy and Licensed Professional Clinical Counselor Graduate Studies Program and is an honorary faculty member of the UC, USC Suzanne Dorak Peck School of Social Work. Would you also welcome Dr. Not Dr. Marlon Morgan. <laughs> maybe, maybe one day, maybe. Um, and finally, I want to introduce you to um, Monica Nepomuceno from the California Department of Education. She is Education Programs Consultant and she is passionate about mental health, specifically student mental health. She received a Master's of Social Work at Sac State and one of her main goals and her missions in life is to uh, ensure that all adults that work with children and youth are aware of and have the skills to support them with their mental health needs in a respectful way. At this time, I'd like to introduce Monica Nethamusen. Good morning, anyone, everyone, anyone and everyone. <laughs> On behalf of the California Department of Education, I want to welcome you to this workshop. 
that's sponsored by the California Department of Education and our friends at Wellness Together. Really want to thank Marlon and Jeremiah and his team for all the wonderful work that they've done in putting this together and other workshops and conferences that we've sponsored. So thank you so much. If we can have a round of applause for all of their work. And effort. Our new state superintendent of public instruction, Tony Thurman, prioritizes uh, the concept of addressing the needs of the whole student and building resilience um, in, among students and improving student wellness to help those students uh, through life's challenges is part of this concept. Our responsibilities as educators is to help students find their own strengths and build skills and a toolbox for them to access um, when they're facing difficult times, right? We, that's not written anywhere in our, in our curriculum in school, right? But it is our ethical uh, responsibility. So the Department of Education is going to continue to partner with Wellness Together um, to bring you other professional developments, opportunities to build your own toolbox and resources so that you can do the most difficult job that you do every day, and that's helping our students. We know that you're passionate um, or you wouldn't be here. We know that you care about our students, and so we want to give you the best information, the best resources that you can access to help support them. Thank you once again for taking the time to be here on a Friday. We understand that a lot of you are going to uh, be starting your spring break real soon, or maybe are on spring break, so we thank you for taking the time. And we also at the Department of Education have created a wellness inbox, so if you have any questions or suggestions for workshops, please email us at wellness at cde.ca.gov and we'll give that information and post it on our website. So thank you very much. And without further ado, I will introduce Marlon. All right. All right, thank you, Monica and the California Department of Education for all of your generous support. I also wanna thank Dr. Norman uh, and Michael Godoy and Mahima for being here. Uh, representing UCSF and all the folks in the room as well. I'm really hoping today will be a uh, excellent use of your time as you look to continue to support your students. We all have a set of tools that we use to get through life's most challenging times. And some of them we're born with, like crying and yelling every time we're hungry, which is one that I tend to use still in my life uh, and uh, others are, are reflexive and when we see something we're scared of we close our eyes other tools we learn from the people uh, around us we might learn to uh, along the way to grow these coping skills out of necessity And so it's often the tools that we use uh, in our lives that eventually define us. I think it was Aristotle that said, we are what we do repeatedly. My first day on the job as a new school counselor years ago, I was taught three tools. The first being uh, how to access the district's intranet. Remember the intranet? Uh, that was sort of like a small internet just for your district and uh, so that I could access and change student schedules and look at their demographic information, contact parents and such. I also learned uh, how to walk a, a student through the college application process, which is very helpful and the students uh, were appreciative, so were the parents. And then uh, thirdly, before the end of the day, another counseling colleague came in and taught me how to make folders in Outlook Na named after my most communicative parents, so that I had all the information that had been uh, supplied to me about their child all in one place. The problem was when my first student came in to uh, have their schedule changed, she asked for the schedule change because she was too depressed to come to school. And so the tools I had just learned turned out not to be very helpful. As school counselors, school psychologists, mental health practitioners on a school campus, 
many of us quickly realize that the tools that we have are not going to be enough. We find ourselves supporting students that often don't have the skills or the tools to rise to some of life's challenges. Our students are overwhelmed with information and followers and underwhelmed with meaningful, authentic relationships that provide a place, a safe place to give and receive emotional support. We've been calling it the five S's. These are what we look for in a student and the things that we try to talk to them about right away. We talk to them about their sleep. We say, you know, do you sleep? Is your phone right next to your bed? Are you looking at blue light before you go to bed? Uh, does it wake you up? Because the quality of your sleep can often dictate the quality of your mental wellness. And that's often a surprise to most of our students. The other, the second S is screen time over authentic relationship. What screen time can do in moderation can be fine and can even be helpful. But what screen time can also do if it's out of balance is create a lifestyle for our students that is solitary and sedentary. And all of this may be leading to what might be the most unhelpful tool of all to get through life's challenges. That's the fifth S, self-medication. More than two thirds of our students have experienced at least one adverse childhood experience by the time they're 16 years old. And in a class of 30, three of those students will have experienced five ACEs. Academic advising is important, but for many of our students, learning isn't as important as survival. Across the country, nearly 20% of our students, that's 8 million, do not have access to a school counselor. And according to the Ed Trust, nearly 3 million of those students don't have access to any type of support outside of their classroom teacher. In California, uh, the school counselor ratio has gotten better over the last few years, but it's still 708 to 1. Whereas most of us know the recommended am amount, uh, sometimes we kind of laugh at is 250 to one, but wouldn't that be nice? A few of us, uh, with so few of us attempting to meet so many needs, we need to rethink and relearn some of the tools that we're using. We need evidence-based tools that are accessible and as engaging as the rest of the internet. We need tools that students and families can use at home together and that students can take with them into young adulthood. As educators, school counselors, school psychologists, and mental health clinicians, we all have the power to change the trajectory, I would say improve the trajectory of our students' lives. And this morning, I hope that you will add a new tool to your toolbox that will empower you to continue providing excellent social emotional support for your students and families. I like GRITX because it combines elements of effective evidence based therapeutic interventions into an engaging and easy to understand platform. It's accessible 24 7 and we are not. I like GridX because it makes student mental wellness engaging and easy to learn. And at this time, it's my pleasure to welcome you, the founder of the UCSF YAFSI, we'll call it, uh, Dr. Kim Norman. Thank you, Marlon, and, and you know, thank you for, for having us. This is such a delight to be here this morning to talk about a topic that we are all passionate about. Um, I can tell you, um, 
I've been practicing psychiatry for 41 years, and it's really a wonderful job. Um, people invite me into their lives, entrust me with revelations of their inner selves, and give me an opportunity to make a difference. I mean, it's really a great experience. Um, when patients I've worked with over time say to me, thank you for not giving up on me, best thing we ever hear as therapists, and the clinicians in, in the room know, know this very much, to be so. But you know, I honestly don't think about that a lot. I enjoy it when I hear it, but I think a lot about are not the people I helped, but the people I couldn't help. Sometimes, uh, never for lack of trying, never for lack of um, desire, uh, sometimes for lack of wisdom. I've tried everything I knew how to do and it still wasn't enough. And so we have to be dedicated as a field toward coming up, ha having a better understanding of psychological development, neurobiological development, and interventions that will make a difference. That has to be a high priority for, for us in the field. Um, but what troubles me the most, what, what keeps, keeps me awake at night, are the kids that I knew how to help. I know, I, I know exactly what the problem is. We have a methodology that will work very effectively, but they can't get in to see me. You know, I see a handful of privileged few who can come to UCSF and come into my office and see me one on one. Uh, for many, uh, we, we know that the lifetime risk of acquiring a mental health diagnosis is 50%. It means in the course of our lifetime, one out of two of us will suffer from depression, anxiety, post traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, substance use, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder one attitude. So it means either you're going to suffer or certainly somebody you love is going to suffer. And uh, we know that three quarters of mental illness is present by the age of 24. Half is present by high school. So a lot of our kids are suffering. As Marlon mentioned, um, the ACE scores, you know, every, um, large percentage of kids have at least one high percentage also have uh, four or more. Uh, uh, all of you familiar with ACE, the, the ACE studies? Um, uh, most, some of you are nodding. So ACE um, stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And it was a fascinating study that was done, actually sponsored by Kaiser Permanente in the late 1990s. They looked at a population in San Diego. They went to a health center in San Diego where there was something like 18,000 patients coming for everything from the common cold to treatment for cancer. And they asked them to fill out a survey. And the survey had 10 questions about adverse childhood experiences. They included things like physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, uh, parents divorcing, a parent being incarcerated, um, being homeless, uh, going hungry, um, questions like that, 10 questions. And the higher your score, especially if your score was four and above, had a very high correlation with mental illness as an adult, heart disease as an adult, uh, pulmonary you know, lung disease as an adult, um, uh, di uh, diabetes, arthritis, virtually every chronic debilitating medical illness as well as mental illness was, associated, was correlated with the higher the ACE score. Um, so we have these kids in our classroom and we are um, determined to help them as best we can. Now, um, In creating the Young Adult and Family Centers, Martin said, what my intent was, was to try to make mental health care accessible uh, to teenagers, young adults, and families. By the way, we call it the Young Adult and Family Center. YAPSI is sort of a silly name, but uh, we know our teenage patients, our 16, 17 year olds, they don't mind being called young adults. Our 21, 22 year olds don't want to be called adolescents, so that's why we're the Young Adult and Family Center. Uh, in 2004, 2005, I created that because the average waiting list time for a child, a teenager to get an appointment at UCSF was about two months, eight weeks. So a mother would call me and say, my daughter's been cutting, um, but it'd be eight weeks to get an appointment. That's just completely unacceptable. So I created the center and it allowed us to expand our brick and mortar services a whole order of magnitude. But you know what, three years later, we're right back to a waiting list because no matter how many um, full-time clinicians we hire, they get filled up really, really, really quickly. And that doesn't help us address um, 
people who live in counties around the United States, 55% of counties in America have not a single behavioral health specialist. So they can't even access somebody if they wanted to. Many more can't access because um, they don't have the right insurance. Uh, and then there's also a subset of people who just will not come because they will not walk into a therapist office. They do not want to be associated you know, with having a mental health challenge. So uh, what we realize is in order to make mental health um, treatment available to everybody, we had to work on a program that would give a scale. We need um, multiple things. We need reach. We need something that would outreach to everybody. So <clears throat> the internet does that very, very well. You can do video chats um, anywhere in the world. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. And, and we know that people who participate in therapy using a video chat feel just as connected to the therapist um, as they do if they're in the room together. In fact, I have to admit my patients say they like me better on video chat because um, <clears throat> I have a little ADD and I tend to look out the window evidently during therapy sessions. And they say like, you know, Dr. Norman, I, I hope it's that you're thinking about me. <laughs> but, when, but when you're one-on-one, -on -one, you know, uh, on video chat, I see your face, your eyes are directed at me. Um, I can't multitask, it's, I get your undivided attention. The other thing they say very interestingly is that they feel more equal on the internet. You know, it's my face and your face, that's not, you know, me and the doctor's chair and you and the patient's chair. Um, so they feel it's more collaborative. Um, and um, they also say even in real time video chat, they're more open emotionally. They feel safer and more open emotionally <clears throat> uh, on video chat than they do in the office. Uh, interesting, and we'll, we'll talk more about this when we present um, our online um, interventions, but we hear from people over and over and over again that they are more open emotionally online than they are in person. It kind of parallels um, the online dating world. When people are dating online, they're willing to be vulnerable. They're willing to say, I'm lonely, I'm looking for a soulmate meet somebody at a party or at a bar after work and the wall of indifference goes up. Like wanna to get together, fine if you do, fine if you don't. So um, it's a human phenomenon. We somehow feel safer when we can just reflect a little bit and then you know, bear our souls. Um, so we sought out to create interventions that would, be, that would have all of the elements, that would have reach and would have scale. Because the problem with, with video chats is it's not scalable. An hour of my time, whether you're in the room with me or you're online with me. So an hour of my time, I can do one hour at a time. Um, so it doesn't have scale, it has reach, but not scale. We needed reach, we needed scale. We need to sustain engagement, which is also a challenge because there are a lot of you know, really cool mental health apps available. Uh, just to name one of them, <clears throat> and I'm talking about them, Sleepio is one, which is, you mentioned sleep, the importance of that. Sleepio is an online uh, program for, um, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. It really, really cleverly done, I think. It's really excellent. Um, another one is Headspace. You probably all know that one, where you can learn mindfulness meditation. Also a really good app. But I'll tell you what happens. Um, people who, who download those apps like them. They're excited about them the first week. Still feeling pretty good about them the second week. But the third week, people are kind of bored with them. They know what's coming. With most online apps for behavioral health are static. The user grows, but the app does not. So sustaining the engagement over time is a challenge. Um, so we need to sustain engagement. We also need to have continuity. Um, in other words, over time, where people can continue to practice skills and continue to focus and reflect on their, their uh, mental wellness. Um, there's a lot of really excellent workshops that are available for things like suicide prevention. There's one, for example, I like uh, Signs of Suicide. They do a fantastic job of coming into the schools for a couple of days and we'll have uh, assemblies with kids, along with parents, with teachers, and they'll talk about recognizing the signs of suicide in oneself and in others. Um, and they do, it's an excellent curriculum. The problem with it though is it's, kind of, it's one and done. You come in, have the assembly, not everybody makes it, some people are out sick, some people are whatever, um, but you don't, keep, you don't continue the conversation. Um, we, um, and we know that the effects of trauma you know, gonna, are gonna persist way beyond a single assembly or way beyond a few months. We need 
Uh, so we need something where people will engage, learn the skills, and then stay with it, have a continued discussion. We think the way to do that is through building communities where you can present content online that's engaging and intriguing, build a community around it, and continue the discussion ongoing so people can join uh, at, any, uh, at, at, at various times. So, um, so again, what our, what our goal is, is really our, our ideal, our dream, is to make it that evidence-based behavioral health care would be available to anyone, anywhere, anytime, 24-7, they just log on. They don't have to declare themselves a patient. There's no stigmatizing. There's just useful tools and then also a, a community to, to engage with. Um, I think the Wellness Together program uh, is a huge step forward in, in, in meeting that, that dream because kids are in school. So providing mental health services, mental health education in schools makes a lot of sense. Uh, other organizations, including where Mahima works, um, are engaged in providing those mental health services in the workplace. And that makes a lot of sense. Adults spend a lot of time at work, kids spend a lot of time at school, go to where they are. But we also have uh, situations, particularly working with teenagers, I have kids telling me all the time, I'd love to talk with you. Um, can we do it at 9.30 tonight? 10 would be even better because between, <laughs> between the, uh, you know, the school play, um, you know, the volleyball practice, college apps, and finals coming up, I'd, I'd love to talk to you. I just can't possibly work it into my schedule. So we need to make that reach where people are, wherever they are. And that was really the logic and the wisdom behind creating um, Grid X as a interactive website where people can learn the things they would learn in a in person, you know, a mental health setting without declaring themselves a patient. They can do it in a in a self paced way. Um, we looked at a lot of efforts, um, previous efforts to create websites that would have a mental health focus, and we realized right away we had a challenge um, because there's been a number of um, behavioral health websites that are out there um, and most of them have come and gone. Um, there is a very uh, well-documented and advertised program called Reach Out Australia. And this is about 10 years ago where they started to add, uh, talk about suicide and suicide prevention uh, really appropriately. By the way, we, it, tragically, we now know that suicide is the second leading cause of death among 10 to 34 year olds. Um, and it's uh, accidents is number one. But even a lot of accidents are actual suicides. We know that a certain number of young people won't necessarily drive to the bridge and jump off it, but they'll drive their car super fast. They won't look when they walk out into the street. They'll take a bunch of drugs and alcohol at a party and they'll wake up fine. If I don't wake up, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, so there's a lot of subintentional suicide that's not counted in the statistic, but suicide um, is definitely um, you know, on the rise. And so, this group called Reach Out Australia in an effort to prevent suicide um, started advertising um, at rock concerts, at uh, radio stations, um, and um, created a website where you could come and read testimonials of um, kids who had overcome adversity, who had had mental health challenges and overcame it. Problem was, you go into the website and after you read three or four or five stories, it's hard to keep reading them. Um, also, uh, it, it turned out that the people who tended to go on the website, it was kind of preaching to the converted. There were kids who already were in therapy, who already were, in fact, who was part of their recovery, had made advocacy for mental health one of their, the things that they would do, and they would come on. But other people wouldn't come on because they didn't want to be associated with coming onto a mental health site. Other kinds of websites that are more lifestyle-like, um, where like a Facebook, -y, you know, look at me at the party, you know, uh, that you didn't get invited to where I'm having a great time. Kids, a lot of kids won't come on that because that's not me. I, I'm, not, I'm not in that friend group crowd where I don't get invited to those parties. And where do I go? So we, we didn't want um, a site that was pathologizing. And we didn't want a site that was kind of trivializing and uh, optimizing a certain kind of fantasy lifestyle. Um, we wanted something where kids could come on wherever they are. And they can come on because um, they have test taking anxiety um, and want to know uh, how to manage that. And uh, by the way, one of the, uh, the ways, when, when I see kids who ask me to help them with test taking anxiety, almost always they ask for medication. 
of course, always tell us, as I'm sure you all do, that the number one remedy for test-taking anxiety is to study harder and be prepared. <laughs> Best way to reduce your anxiety by taking a test is to be prepared for it. Um, but then what they want is something like a, a medication, a, a beta blocker like you know, propanolol, which will slow down the heart rate or Valium kind of medication. Um, one of the studies, and we, we, we quote this on our site, is ask a kid an hour before the test to write down the worst fears. I'm gonna fail the test. If I fail the test, I'm gonna fail the class. If I fail the class, I'm gonna be kicked out of college. If I'm kicked out of college, my parents will disown me and I'll be homeless. And then they can chuckle and say, okay, that's not gonna happen, it's one test. I'll do my best and you know, but my life isn't gonna change because of it. But simple things like that can make a big difference. Or they can come on because they're having problems with the roommate or they can come on because they want to learn how to be their best possible self or handle certain situations. Uh, or they could come on if they are having um, a challenge of overcoming a trauma like a sexual assault. Um, or um, if they're wondering, is this teenage blues or am I getting depressed? So you can come on to learn more and more um, if you're really wanting to understand yourself from a, a psychological perspective or you just want to work on having tools for coping better in life or you want to be able to um, you know have better friendships um, all of that is is we try to encompass on the site and um, we use on the site skills that we know are evidence-based as effective in managing anxiety overcoming depression um, surviving trauma um, and just you know having a better optimal opportunity to enjoy life and become your best possible self. And so all of those are skills are there. So I think with that, um, I again want to just thank you so much for having us here and uh, being willing to, to participate in this demo. And Michael, I'll turn it over to you to start the demo. Perfect. All right. Well, from my experience working at the Young Adult Family Center, I like to call us like the Mental Health Innovation Center just because of all the wonderful innovations I've seen in the mental health space. I've seen us develop a DBT clinic um, and build that up and give it to UCSF proper. I've seen unique therapies like the Reflecting Room Clinic. But I think what appeals to me the most as a technology enthusiast is our work in scalable therapeutics. So when I try to describe to people what I do, like they hear scalable therapeutics and they really don't know what I do. So I, I figure I should just open it up and, and describe it. Um, so our whole goal at the OPSI and specifically in the Scalable Therapeutics Program is to really expand access to care. And so right now, um, the first level of care is when you're in person, it's one-on-one -on -one, and there's barriers of time logistic, location logistics, and cost logistics. And then there's kind of the second wave in expanding access to care where it's like telemedicine, what Dr. Norman had mentioned, you know, him in front of a patient. But obviously that's limited because there's only one Dr. Norman, unfortunately. So <laughs> it's not, it's, it's synchronous. You have to be there in person and it's limited in its scale. And then the third kind of wave of expanding access to care is called scalable therapeutics. So it's ways to scale the kind of clinical power of a clinician to as many people as possible. And the way we've discovered to do this is things through websites, through courses. And what we've realized is through our scalable therapeutics program, we're able to reduce all the barriers to access to care, including time logistics, because you could access it anywhere. The internet doesn't go down. You could access it whenever. Um, time logistics, and most importantly, cost logistics. Our website is completely free for anybody to access, so there's no barriers in that regard. Can I add also, uh, Michael, there's also um, the self-pace part of it, because sometimes um, all of us clinicians, know we have people who get overwhelmed and they walk out of the session or they shut down in the session. Here, somebody could come on, do some work. If they get a little bit overwhelmed and they need to take a minute, catch their breath, or come back another time they can, they can pace themselves as they go deeper and deeper into the skills learning. Exactly. Um, so we're trying to figure out ways to kind of expand therapeutics to the masses. And we've tried to integrate GRIT as the core concept in all of our projects, including our scalable therapeutics projects. And so this is kind of a visual representation of all of our projects and how GRIT is at the center of everything that we do and everything we, do, we design. Um, so as you go into the most inner layers of the circles, that's more you're in person, you're getting the care, it's one-on-one. -on -one. And as you go outside of the rings, you get to more self-care where at the last ring, it's all self-care stuff. You don't need to see a doctor to get that type of care. Can 
tonight. Um, sorry, Adrian, but um, does everybody know um, or have ideas about why we chose the name Grit? Anybody? Okay. Um, so grit um, is defined not the dirt grit, but <laughs> grit as a as a human characteristic, as a quality, is defined as passion and perseverance in pursuit of a meaningful goal. You know, nothing worth accomplishing in life comes easy. You gotta work at it. Sometimes you get knocked down and discouraged and you wanna give up and quit. You gotta pick yourself up, dust yourself off and keep going. And grit, studies on grit uh, show that grit is the single quality that's most associated with success in young adulthood. You gotta, you gotta have that perseverance and that passion um, to succeed. Exactly. Um, so as part of one of our projects in GRIT, um, we've developed an interactive psychoeducational website called GRITX. Um, you could access it by um, going to gridx.org. And so I'm just going to take you through a demo of each section of our site and how it could be used in, in the student population. Um, so the first kind of our heaviest content area is the Skill Studio. Um, so I'm just going to click on this link. And so the way that the Skill Studio is set up is it's set up in categories. So oftentimes when you think of going into a therapy office, you would imagine that a psychiatrist identifies how you're feeling. And if you're feeling anxious, they give you the proper tools you need to help reg regulate that anxiety. And so in the same way, our Skill Studio is set up by emotions. So if a user comes to the Skill Studio and they're feeling anxious and they're feeling overwhelmed, um, they could go to the anxiety section and we have different skills that could help with anxiety. For example, um, the body scan skill has been a very popular one just because of how simple it is. And really what the body scan asks you to do is just to take account of your body and how you feel and how every area your body feels. And it's more of a grounding exercise to help you come back from that anxious, overwhelmed state. Yeah, this was a skill um, actually developed by John Kabat-Zinn uh, and created um, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, some of you may be familiar with that. And the body scan, you just start from the top of your head and work down to the to your toes, or start with your toes, work up to the top of your head. And as you're breathing in and out, you're relaxing all of the muscle groups in your body. And it's um, just a great way to take a few minutes and reduce stress. Um, if you're having trouble falling asleep and you do that in bed, you fall asleep in a few minutes most of the time. Exactly. Um, so oftentimes, when people are going through high levels of uh, just being overwhelmed with everything that's happening in their life, they can't really identify how they feel. And so for those people, they could come to the skill studio and go to the I don't know section, where we describe basically um, the 101 of all the different emotions, like surprise, anxiety, um, anger. And so users could click on surprise, for example, and they could get some type of scenario so that they could relate to, um, so that they could really identify how they feel. And once they've identified how they feel, they could go to the proper section of the site that could help them regulate that emotion. And finally, in our skill studio, um, most of our skills are categorized by emotion, as I mentioned, but we're also trying to categorize skills by issue-based um, skills. So for example, if you're having, um, maybe you, you lost a pet, you, your, your dog died, um, you could come to the skill studio and you could come to the grief and loss section and there's different skills and different readings that could help you with grief and loss. Or maybe you want to just be the best you you could possibly be. And if that's the case, you come to the best selves and there's different skills and readings that could help with um, best self. So for example, um, one of our interns actually put together a really um, innovative quiz to basically help you identify your character strengths and virtues. Yeah, there's a lot that you're covering already, Michael. Um, so one of the things that's always intrigued me as a, as a clinician and, and as a, a scholar of psychology is how in all cultures throughout recorded history, you think about somebody you really admire to be somebody, a historical figure like a Martin Luther King, or um, uh, if you're lucky, maybe somebody you know in your personal life, or it can be a fictional character in a book and movie, a book or movie. Um, but it turns out it's the same 24 character strengths and virtues that exist in people that we admire. And sort of loosely grouped, they include strengths of knowledge. We like people who are wise, people who um, are curious, who are non-judgmental, who love learning. We like uh, 
strengths and courage, people who are brave and will fight the, the good fight or who will take healthy risks. We like uh, people with strengths of humanity who are loving, compassionate, kind, empathetic. We like people who have strong sense of social justice and uh, who are team players and fair and uh, embrace equality. We like people who have um, self-discipline um, and control and grit. Um, and then we like strengths of transcendence. They include things like a sense of humor, the spirituality, an ability to appreciate beauty, um, an ability to experience awe and wonder. And these are um, these character strengths, um, which studies in humans, were born with the capacity. We all have them to some degree. But what's really critical, and Marlon brought this out, you know, the human brain is basically resilient. When there's a terrible trauma, it could be a fire, a flood, a horrible um, act of gun violence, you know, everybody's traumatized around, around the event. Six months later, 90% of people are kind of back to their normal selves. And about 20% of them feel that they've grown as a result of the trauma. It's about 10% of the population that will stay in uh, traumatic states, as, as though the event happened this morning and we give them post-traumatic stress disorder. So we, uh, the human brain is, in fact, incredibly resilient, generally. But the skills, the tools that make us resilient can be learned. We can get better at it. And that's really, um, most psychotherapies really are designed to teach resiliency, and they can, and they can be taught. Um, as Michael was, was showing you the organization, again, can you go back to the um, emotions? Um, yeah. Right again. Yeah. So um, Michael started with surprise. Actually, surprise is a um, very positive emotion. Um, surprise um, is like that aha moment when you discovered you know, something um, that you hadn't expected, whether it's um, the food tasted way better than you thought it was, or you turn, or you get around a curve when you're hiking, you see this amazing vista. The ability to be surprised really drives us. Um, it starts, I think, with babies playing peekaboo, <laughs> you know, and the joy they get from that. Um, and so what happens sometimes when people have been battered around a bit, they get really cynical, and uh, they can't be surprised. Nothing surprises them. So the reason we have this as an emotion that you definitely need to cultivate is get rid of that cynicism, open yourself up to, to having those aha moments and being, being surprised and feeling joy from it. Then, of course, it's easier to understand why if you start with I'm sad or I'm anxious or people would want to manage those emotions. Okay, go ahead. I'll continue the self-care token. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so that was the skill studio. Um, the next section of our site is the self-care toolkit. Um, so I like to think of the self-care toolkit as kind of like Amazon's one-click shopping. You come, to, you come to the self-care toolkit and everything you need is right there. And if it's not there, you could click one button and find what you need. Um, so for the self-care toolkit, we've kind of um, aggregated all these self-care tools that you might already do yourself. It's not as in-depth as like the skill studio where it's like a tutorial on a self-care skill. It's more like things you do like yoga, like take a shower, like self-hug if you're into that type of thing. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, so basically, if you wanna feel calm, you'd come in here and um, we have descriptions on each of these self-care tools and you add them to your toolbox. And so, yeah, go ahead, do great. Okay, <laughs> all, right. all right. And once you find all the tools that could help you, you put in your toolkit and you could save it and print it and kind of take it with you wherever you go. Yeah, one of, um, what the self-care toolkit is about is, is both that you can change your emotion by doing something that evokes the emotion, do something more joyful and you're gonna feel more joy. Um, but it's also intended for when people have, um, they're in distress, they're overwhelmed, they're, they don't know what to do, and they're at higher risk of doing something substituting like you know, drinking or being promiscuous or spending money they don't have or cutting, self-injuring, or even becoming suicidal or violent. So um, what we know, though, some, a simple thing like a therapist for years have been having patients do things like, let's get some poker chips and then write some things down that are like, you know, buy, get an ice cream cone, you know, go for a walk, you know, uh, pet your dog, call your friend, um, enter some notes in your journal. So you reach into your pocket, you pull out a poker chip, okay, I'm going to get an ice cream cone. Um, and so this just says you, you know, kind of tells you you always have some tools at your end, no matter how awful it feels in any given moment, there's something you can do to feel better or to at least to manage that, that painful feeling. The Buddhists call it radical acceptance. I'm in a situation, can't change it, so I've got to accept it, but I need some, 
some help in getting there. And, and that's what the self-care toolkit is uh, designed to help you create. Exactly. Um, so in the self-care toolkit too, um, you could also create your own tool if there's one that's not listed here. Um, so that's the self-care toolkit. The next section of our site, hold on. Oh. is the breathing room. So the breathing room is really special because kind of like Headspace and Calm, um, it, it takes you through a guided breathing exercise that helps reduce anxiety, but better than Calm and Headspace is free. So, <laughs> so that's where we have the advantage. Um, so basically a user would come here when they're feeling overwhelmed and anxious and they could create their own breathing room. So first um, you set the background that you like, um, we have different kind of ambient therapeutic noises that you could play. So once you find one that you like, let's see, garden. And then we have different breathing patterns <laughs> um, that help with anxiety. So you could do four square breathing, you know, four um, seconds in, holding for four seconds, let it out for four seconds and hold it again and repeat. Um, and that's been help, um, useful and also it's part of our courses for 7-8 breathing and 7-11 breathing. Let's just take a minute to breathe. It's, um, you know, it seems so, so trite and simple, but there's nothing like breathing <laughs> to really calm the body. It works every time, really quickly, yeah. A kind of humiliating story is in college, actually, was the first time that I learned how to breathe properly. It's, it's a very awkward thing to say, because I went to UC Berkeley, and they're like, you're supposed to be smart. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, I know. I, I just like, I realized that, you know, the way I was breathing was actually making me anxious and I'd always be kind of very tense. And it wasn't until I learned how to breathe properly that I could let go and be more in my body. Um, so that's really the benefits of the breathing room. Yeah, to my, my breathing story, I um, really enjoy bicycling. It, it doesn't show because I enjoy eating even more. <laughs> but um, but in, in bicycling, you know, what everybody worries about in San Francisco, they have big hills, and they do. And I realized when I was first starting to climb the hills, I couldn't get very far before I was out of breath and in pain, because what do you do when you have to, you know, kind of strain a little bit as you clench your teeth and you stop breathing? So after about, you know, 10 seconds, I was out of breath. When I realized, no, just breathe, just breathe in and out. Just, you know, the, the bicycle I have has, you know, 18 gears, so, you know, I have the leg strength. Um, but what I wasn't doing was breathing. So just remembering to breathe uh, gets you through really almost any challenge. Exactly. Um, so the next section of our site is called the self-interview. And so from everyone that's used a self-interview, they say this is the most innovative aspect of our site because it does the number one goal of any therapist, which I've told from a therapist, is to increase a person's self-reflective capacity. And so the self-interview takes you through a guided experience to do just that. Yeah. Let me just get the background. We um, read a New York Times uh, magazine article about four years ago, and it was about women in the video game industry, women who, do, <coughs> women who develop games. And there's several things that stood out. One is there are very few of them. Two is that they're subject to intense discrimination by the men. And third is when they'd create a game that would tend to have a serious theme like um, suicide prevention or overcoming depression or managing a breakup. And so we, um, I called uh, one of the women who was uh, featured in the article because she created a game called Player Two, where you're both players and you ask yourself questions, you ask yourself a series of questions to go deeper into yourself. And so she created for us this um, video game style um, self-interview where really, again, it's designed to uh, give you the permissions to and and guide guidance to start to look a little deeper. And initially, you know, I was concerned people would find this kind of a little bit superficial. 
Um, but kids are telling us, no, this is great. I want my parents to do it. I want my friends to do it. And what I realized is, you know, in 40 years of practice as a psychiatrist, um, I do a lot of self-reflecting and I teach self-reflecting all the time and don't realize that most people have not been taught how to do it or most people are given the message. Nobody cares what you feel inside. Just follow the rules, just turn in your assignment. So creating, carving out a space where we're saying your feelings matter, your deeper feelings matter. And, you know, feel, not only feel free, we, we encourage you strongly to look inside. Um, uh, really grabs people. So, exactly. Um, so I'm just going to take you through a short demo of how the self-interview works. So if, for example, if someone's feeling overwhelmed, um, something crazy happened in their life, or they're giving like a talk at a speech like this, um, <laughs> you might want to come to the self-interview. And when you come to the self-interview, we present you with different options, different kind of threads that we've created around um, certain issues. And so if you're feeling overwhelmed, you click on the I feel overwhelmed. Um, and we have text that's supposed to slow you down um, and very much like the, the kind of copy, the kind of speech that a therapist would give you. Yeah, it's kind of like the opposite of BuzzFeed. You know, it's not like 27 things coming at you really fast. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, initial feedback, not from our kids, but from um, some of my colleagues who are clinicians who are saying, okay, but everybody wants the internet to go super fast. I don't want this is going really slow. But that's the, by design. We want you to take a moment, slow down, you know, reflect a little bit. Exactly. So, it may be small, but it's where we can start. Choose an object in the space around you. Large or small, it doesn't matter. It just has to be something you could see from where you're at. What are you looking at? I'm looking at uh, a camera. This object is now your grounding object. Think of it like a lightning rod for your uh, nerves. And so as you can see, it kind of takes you through very much similar dialogue to what a therapist would do if you're feeling overwhelmed and they need to guide you through a grounding exercise. I mean, mainly because it was designed and created by therapists. Um, but yeah, so there's different sections of the site on the self-interview. Um, one where you could see where you just type in a word or you click through different options on words or other, they're more um, free form. Um, so this asks, for example, instead of saying a plant, tell me it's fern. So it just has you dive a little bit deeper into that grounding exercise and describe what I'm looking at, the camera. So I might say, you know, it's a Logitech camera with a blue light. That's good. This, is, this practice is called grounding. There's lots of ways to do it, but this is a simple one we can use right now. And... I mean, so it, it actually also has a second skill that's in it, um, which is observe and describe. Um, you know, this is a, a, gro a gross oversimplification, but I like to teach that the brain is in three major parts. There's um, the lizard brain, the brain stem, um, which lizards have and mammals have too, um, that governs fight or flight. Uh, it's all that lizards have, but if you make your living catching flies, you don't want to be daydreaming anyway. Um, so Fight or flight is the most primitive basic structure of the brain. And then we have the limbic system, which has emotions. Because once species started having babies outside their bodies, you need emotions like love or the baby will die. And then um, higher mammals and primates and humans, of course, uh, have a thinking brain where you can um, anticipate, reflect, um, plan. Um, but in a um, fight or flight situation, like if you're hiking on a trail, and you see what looks like a snake right in front of you, you freeze or you run, um, the brainstem, the fight or flight part of the brain will just hijack the rest of the brain and move you away. So it says, don't sit there and describe the colors of the snake, get away, you know. <laughs> but, if you, um, but if you are actually at the zoo and the snake is behind, you know, a glass, okay, you know, a glass wall and you're safe, so you can now describe the colors. When you're observing and describing, you're telling the, the fight or flight part of the brain, you can calm down now, things are okay. And that's really a lot of, a lot of um, mindfulness meditation, if you've uh, been taught that is, you're focusing on something and you're describing it. And you're describing it, you know, I always uh, teach my patients, think as if you're gonna um, write a, a text or an email to your best friend describing, describing you know, the flower you're looking at, the, Whatever you're, whatever you're looking at, and, and indeed, you start to calm down. But that's, that's also built in that grounding exercise. Exactly. Um, so you can imagine a similar type of experience for any issue that um, a user may be feeling, and just going through this type of process and how it could be therapeutic. 
Um, so this is our self-interview. Um, we just show the okay. list of the, the threads that we have at this moment. Okay. Um, <coughs> So at the current time, we have just generally feeling overwhelmed, but there's one that's specific for grief and loss. Um, one, um, I have a secret eating away at me, which um, often for kids either can be that there's been some kind of um, abuse at home, uh, sexual abuse uh, in particular. Uh, or sometimes uh, we have a, a, com a separate thread around uh, gender and sexual orientation, but sometimes that secret is um, being a sexual minority, but not being able to tell anybody about it. But but this just creates a safe place where you can start to reflect and kind of get grounded and then go from there. Um, of course, for kids um, having um, trouble with their friend group um, or trouble with, you know, with family um, or there is threads. At the present time, we, at least for this iteration, we kept out artificial intelligence because we wanted to, we, we want to encourage self-reflection. So we don't want to, you know, the therapist to tell you or um, uh, a bot to tell you. But we are, um, by the end of summer, we will have um, a therapy bot or a grid X bot as well. So if you want to do it a little more guided, um, you, as you write in your text about, you know, um, you know um, my best friend, you know, and I had a big fight. Now I don't have my best friend anymore. I've lost that. But the bot will actually start to ask you more questions and, and guide you through you know, one of these exercises, if you choose. You can have a guided bot do this, or you can just do it all on your own. Exactly. Um, OK. So that's our self-interview. Um, the next section of our site is uh, the journal. And so the journal is based on Penn and Baker's um, journaling exercises, which basically showed that if you journal for at least 20 minutes for four days about a traumatic experience, that the rates of anxiety and depression go dramatically down. So based on that fact, um, we built out this journal where we have uh, created different prompts around issues that young adults may be experiencing. Maybe they had a difficult interaction with a loved one. Um, maybe they're just not you know, sending texts home to, to mom. You know, So maybe they want to write a gratitude letter. Whatever the issue may be, um, we have prompted journals for it. So for example, if you have um, a difficult interaction with your uh, dad, you could come here and we have different prompts that could help you journal about that experience and gain diff uh, deeper insight into it. Yeah, uh, when, um, I really love that the pages turn. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, it took a lot of engineering for this, like an unbelievable, where you'd be like, it's not, almost not worth it. The pages turn. <laughs> it's just like, it's very hard to do this. Um, <laughs> Thank you, engineers. Yeah, um, yeah um, Michael mentioned um, Pennebaker. So Jamie Pennebaker is a professor of psychology at University of Texas in Austin who has built his career around um, the therapeutic healing value of journaling. And interestingly, um, he's, he um, this is at the University of Texas in Austin, fantastic university. Uh, downside is it's fairly homogeneous, you know, almost all lily, lily white in terms of the student body affluent in a school. And so he started with some freshman English classes asking people to just take 20 minutes and write about a difficult event. And he was just blown away by the number of students who would write about, um, you know, our domestic violence, you know, alcoholism, uh, sexual abuse, emotional abuse in, in behind those white picket fences where they live. Um, but what they would describe is in getting into the exercise and writing about a difficult event, initially you get a little bit emotionally overwhelmed. Um, uh, he likens it, and I think it's a good analogy, to like if you go to a really um, powerful but sad movie, you know, for a little while afterwards, you're still going to feel that sadness, but then later you're going to come back to your normal self. So what he found was the initial writing was cathartic and people would feel the emotions, but over the coming days they would describe like a weight stigma. You know, cloud that had been following me is no longer there. And it's something that's just simple and easy and free for anybody to do. They can do it for us for free. They can also take a pad and pencil and, and, and write. But we really, really want to encourage, um, you know, just finding the words to say it. Again, that involves that thinking brain that will calm down the fight or flight part of the brain, get you in touch with strengths um, you didn't realize you have and, and awareness of feelings you didn't realize you had. And then uh, it creates the pathway for recovery. 
Exactly. And some people, they do have the words to say, and that does help them. But other people, they're a little bit more visual, and it's more like what images they want to present. So for those type of people, we have our sketchbook. Um, so our sketchbook set up that, you know, you could set up your background, you could add text, you could draw on it, you could add different shapes, you could add different stamps, you could do just pretty much anything you could do on a sketch pad, you could do in our... Um, like make it a collage. In exactly. Like that. That's for people, yeah. And um, similar to the journal where we have prompts, we also have prompts in our sketchbook. So for example, this one um, asks you to kind of create what you imagine 20 years from now your life to look like. And so through collaging, through getting images, through doing stamps, through um, doing text, you could actually imagine and visualize your future that you want to have. Um, and I think that's, that's what's there, Michael. Um, so some, we have exercises, like I, I particularly like the, um, feel, you, the, feel your power. The feel your power, yeah. So, so that one just asks you, take a, once you do it, Michael, um, <laughs> it asks you to take, um, like maybe you're being bullied. So you'll be, you choose a snap. Yeah. Why don't you, can you do that? Oh. Yeah, okay. So some, it says. You don't have to read it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just, okay. it. just just show them. Um, so go to like the, get a little person. Yeah. So what <laughs> basically you, what this says is if you're being like bullied at school, you'll have an image of like a child, then you'll have a big bully, and then you'll bring in a lion or an elephant to like devour the bully. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's a big yeah, so, so on the left side, you have kind of what's your worry, what's your concern, the bully. The bully. Um, we'll just put them in a, you know, a red tie. Red tie people are bullies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then on the right side, um, you could put what kind of represents power for you. And um, for that, um, it's kind of like a lion. I always think of kind of like the lion as like the symbol of courage. I know, but we should get a scarier looking lion. Yeah. The one <laughs> <laughs> This one you want to cuddle. <laughs> you should ask my girlfriend. Sometimes cute things come in terrifying packages. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah. Real quick, a question. We're getting feedback on the webinar. Are, are hearing you? Oh, sorry. Can you mind okay. a little bit? The microphone's right there. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm not trying to be a bully. Just <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I mean, as you can tell, even we're having fun with it, even just showing yeah. it to you. So the, you know, you can have fun with it, or it can be more serious. But, um, but it, just taking time out and reflecting on an issue, and then showing it pictorially, um, may work um, better for many people than they're not mutually exclusive. But many people are more visual arts oriented than they would be more verbal text oriented. Exactly. Um, so yeah, that's an overview of the sketchbook area. Um, and so back to GRIT, um, we have a lot of different psychotherapeutic projects on our platform. And when someone that comes to our site, they could be overwhelmed. Like, what do I do? Do I go to the breathing room? Do I go to the skill studio? What do I do for my issue? And for that, um, we've set up something called GRIT Expeditions. And so GRIT Expeditions takes whatever issue um, you're experiencing or whatever area of your life that you want to develop, and we've curated content to help you with that. Um, so, Dr. Norman, I don't know if you want to talk more about this. Yeah, um, we certainly set, set the site up in a way that people can just explore it, come on and just kind of play around with it. Maybe be, before we end the demo, we can also show what the landing page looks like. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, the, um, but if you're coming and you have something specific, uh, you want help with depression, uh, sadness or anxiety or, say, trauma and grief, you can just click on it, and then it's going to give you... Um, a pathway. It's going to give you a guide, uh, a guidebook on what you should do. Do this self interview exercise. Do these, do these skill studios exercises. Create this in your toolkit. Do this journal exercise. Uh, if people would, pref some people will prefer to have a, you know, tell me where to go, where I'm going to find what I'm looking for on the site. Exactly. Um, so in this way, we're kind of curating the GridX experience to any user that comes onto our site. Um, so. That's a little bit about GRIT Expeditions. Just want, to quick, just quickly show the landing page. Okay. Just want to quickly show the landing page when you come on to GRIDX. Um, and we really want to show this just because everybody that sees our site, they're like, they don't believe that UCSF 
made this. In fact, it looks like nothing that UCSF has ever made. So really it's on, that's intentional. That's to make it more about you, to make it more feel like you're a part of a community and not something so clinical. We get a lot of feedback that kids like that they can just see other kids they can relate to. And I wanted to show it because that's my daughter. <laughs> so most important part of our demo. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just in showing you the homepage, that just shows how different we are from kind of every other behavioral health care initiative. Um, and with that, I think we could um, take questions until our break. Yes. The golf interview being uh, like a, a great tool, but also something that would work best if someone was very self aware. And then you were talking about the bot. So, is there, is there a way for if a student wanted to get on and didn't want to involve their parents, if you would be able to say, You're really great at listening, you're really great at this? Is there a way to, I guess, have something online to help them a little bit more? Yeah, um, so in, in setting this up, we, we have um, piloted this with a number of middle school students. Um, now again, these the students we've chosen may be, like you say, kids who are more self-aware to begin with, so they, they seem fine with it because uh, middle school kids will sort of look up toward high school kids. The, the high school kids don't want to sort of hang out or act like um, middle school kids. Um, the language is pretty simple and straightforward, so any eighth grader would be able to follow it. But I think you're raising a really important point because some of them may still find it like just kind of too much, just, just outside what their spirits of experience is. So um, we are um, adding bot technology and we certainly could have that bot. Um, in fact, um, the, the bot we're creating will have a lot of personality, but one of it will in fact be to give praise and to give feedback. We we'll also for um, older teens have a sarcastic bot because I actually, um, <laughs> You know, I mean, sarcasm, sarcasm is, as far as I'm concerned, is a superpower. I mean, sometimes it's really an important one to have. But, but you're 100% you're correct, and, and that's really thoughtful uh, that we need to be, um, we, need, we do need to have something for some younger kids who need a little bit gentler um, guidance through the site who may want to do it without their, who would do it without their parents. Um, now, some of those kids, we think um, middle school um, teachers and middle school counselors might guide them through the site, you know, show them through, and that, that would be their own addiction to them. They can do it later on their own. But you're, but yes, thank you. We definitely, we definitely need to have a bot that would also be friendly like that. More questions? Yeah. Um, I also have a question uh, regarding the kind of going with the students with that, but to say like for our school, we have sixth graders, fifth through 12th graders, and yet the, the language is easy to read, but what if some of our sixth graders don't know some of the words? Is there a way that you can do like audio? Yes, um, we didn't demo that, but, but each of the- the question for the Oh, I'm sorry. So the question is um, for um, a school that has six to 12th graders, where um, some of the, and by the way, it doesn't really matter whatever age, yeah. they're gonna be some, they're gonna be some kids who, um, whose reading skills are limited. Um, and so the question was, uh, would there be a way to listen um, audio-wise? And yes, the, can you go on it, Michael? Um, we do have, um, the skills do have uh, an audio at the bottom you can click on and, uh, is that one going? Is the sound on? Or yeah. I, um, the sound may have been turned up, but anyway. Share, you can lie down. Whatever works for you, where you won't be distracted too much. Yeah, so so all of the skills, I think at this point, some of them, but by the time we are ready in May, um, all of the skills will have that audio. And so, but thank you, great, great, uh, great point. Um, other questions? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, when you come onto the skill studio and you click on the skill, you'll see at the bottom uh, an arrow. Um, and a, and a bell, so you can you can listen to it. Uh huh. Yes. Just thinking as um, you know, working with high risk youth and mm -hmm. 
one of the programs we're piloting for social emotional learning and mental health wellness is it's like triggered it sends somebody an email if you see some trigger words like yeah. i'm gonna kill myself right, right. So, it, so it i was just on the site a minute ago and it uh -huh. sort of said this isn't cracking and it's not and so it just makes me think maybe there's no way for adults at the school to go in and monitor safety of Particular students or something like um, we will um, we will track well no we'll have a uh, by August we'll have you will have the capability of having a MyGridX and so we can track individuals right now you know we're torn between wanting to protect privacy yeah. at all costs and not having any um, private health information that would be you know stored anywhere. Mm -hmm. People will be able to have MyGridX and they can store um, their input and we can track it. Uh, we'll let people know too. What we will do, um, we're launching in the Novato school districts in May, uh, in Santa Ana school districts in the fall semester. And we will have the capability um, to track kids whose families have agreed for them to sign up and be tracked. And if we do see, um, uh, words like suicide or um, um, or violence of any kind, um, we can we would alert the school counselor and the parents that this is what we've seen. We make it clear because um, this is come on anywhere twenty four seven. We're not an emergency room. We're not taking the place of um, um, emergency room visit, but we have to absolutely will use our um, AI um, to track any kind of um, scary, you know, word or not just individual words but phrases like you know goodbye the world um you know this is the end anything's along those kinds of lines uh we will definitely um track it we'll also be able to track changes in mood so a kid who's mostly you know, <coughs> upbeat and goofing around all of a sudden you get a lot of depressed text uh you know things are dark and bleak and hopeless um so they might not yet be at the point of suicide but we're getting a tone that might, um, we get in a tone that might um, suggest the potential of a person slipping into suicide, uh, then we'll be able to alert, you know, parents and um, uh, school counselors. And I just wanted to add to the way that Wellness Together is using it with therapists. We have an MOU with UCSF and we're also piloting a grid right now. And the, the, the nice thing about that is they have a therapist that they're working with regularly every week. And so if they're seeing the tools, they can also uh, let that therapist know, call and email our therapists. And so they're not, they're, they're sort of, at least for this pilot that we're doing, uh, as using GRIT as a secondary curriculum for our therapists uh, and the students we work with, there's some immediate feedback that happens because there's a person attached to it as well. So I think that's another way that it can be used and I think right right out of the box, right away, and we're using it that way. Now, so this would be how we would be able to track it for people who've given us permission to. If we have a user, we don't know. We don't know who they are, somebody who's come on and they've made a threat of harm to themselves or uh, violence in the community. Um, then we do have protocols where we will, you know, we alert the police, they track down the internet service provider and they do the best they can. Um, and that's been established over the 20 years or so of the graphical, you know, um, internet um, where um, lots of internet service providers have been confronted with situations where they get a very disturbing message. And, uh, and I think as we've worked out as a society, their job is to turn that over to the police who will call, again, the service provider, do the best they can to track that person. So that, that's, that's what we're planning at this point. We, we've intended this really for um, the youngest being sort of 13 to 26. Um, and uh, so I would say probably 12. Um, the, it would be the youngest. We've, we've given it to some 10, 11 year olds, but they gotta be fairly precocious in, in terms of their verbal skills. I think 12 year olds. Now partly the reason we choose that age group, that's the age group that we work with at the Young Adult and Family Center at UCSF. But in California, kids 12 and above can seek a psychotherapy 
um, or, or psychological assessment without parental consent. Now, we as clinicians would have to document as to why we're not including the parents. Sometimes it may be a CPS issue where we, you know, there's a violence in the home where we have to call Children's Protective Services. Sometimes it's a, a gay youth uh, who isn't quite ready to come out to the family. Sometimes they just are embarrassed and don't want their parents to know that they're struggling with something. So 12 is the age at which we've decided that kids have enough wisdom and ability to kind of reach out on their own. Um, the upper age of, of 26 we do, because actually that's, you can still be on your parents' health insurance <laughs> until 26. But anyway, um, but really sort of our sweet spot, to be, to be honest, is really 16 to 24 year olds, but 12 to 16 year olds will still get a fair amount out of it. <coughs> oh yeah, all ages. Yeah, every, and, and every skill is a life skill. I mean, we all practice it. Um, they're, they're useful, not just if you are struggling with anxiety or depression, but just getting through life. You know, they're, they're good skills to have. And you had a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I know technology is coming out, but you still, by any time, you guys have this like, as an app. Where the mm -hmm. students can just, I, if I, they don't have access to an actual computer, they can just log on. Well, it, it is on a website. You don't. Oh, if they don't have the computer, can they get there from their cell phone? Yeah. Um, you can. You can use your cell phone to go on to the website, and you can um, still use it. It's 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 mobile. Yeah. You can look at your cell phone now if you have uh, either an Android or a, um, a iPhone. Uh, but also, John, who's sitting in the back, is creating our app, and by by August, we'll have it as a separate app because there's, the one thing that you you can do just about everything mobile, just with a mobile site. But the, um, the self-interview, you, you can do it, but it, it, it's much easier in an app. Um, the sketchbook, you can only do in an app, at least the, the drawing pieces of it. Yeah. Do you also have multilingual uh, We will have a Spanish language, um, uh, as well as, um, as our first uh, second language site. Um, that will be available in August, and we'll add other languages as we go on. But right now, California, English, and Spanish, are, of course, are the two commonest languages. We, we're very well aware that there are many kids from other um, uh, backgrounds where not, neither English nor Spanish will, will work, um, but this is where we're starting. Will the audio also be in Spanish as well? Yes. Yeah. Um, I know that sometimes when you're working with at-risk populations, especially, well, just in general, there's adults that have emotional delayed maturity. And, and I can see the benefit for parents, even, and yes. many adults. How is there any access for adults? Well, it, again, the, the gritx.org is... It's just, it's just it's open. Anybody can come out anywhere. Um, we are getting that feedback from kids saying, I want my mom to do this. I want my parents. I, I can't tell you how many times in the course of my career I've heard, I don't need to be here. My parents need serious therapy. <laughs> it's a, oh boy. And you know, a lot of the times they're right, you know. So um, what, and in the, 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 the last segment when we talk about um, the, um, the courses, uh, what Teatros does and what we do in collaboration uh, to where we um, use the principles of a flip-flop classroom. That is, you know, you watch videos, do personal exercises, come online for facilitated discussions. That definitely has components to include parents, caregivers, and, and all, but we'll talk about that in the next segment. Okay, so thank you so much um, for your questions. We're gonna take a break until 11 o'clock, uh, and then all questions could be asked after the next segment. Okay, um, so we've kind of showed you a demo of every section of GridX, um, and we're currently developing new sections of GridX, so we're just gonna run by um, those different sections. So first is um, our group chat. We, we hope to build a community around peers that they could just kind of share their own life experiences and bond over that. And so the group chat would allow people to anonymously log on to a chat room and to be able to talk with other people um, about their life experiences. And in that similar vein, um, we're also developing uh, kind of a magazine for GRIT. Um, we're calling it GRIT Stories. And um, maybe Dr. Norman, mm -hmm. you wanna talk more about stories and communities? Sure. Um, what children the what the group magazine looks like. Um, the, um, you know, the way we learn, um, the way I'm sure most of you teach is through storytelling. 
I mean, it's really around a story that we learn important points. So we're creating um, an interactive um, magazine we're calling uh, Grit Stories, where people can submit stories about, um, a, a, really about epiphanies in their life, where they learn something. Um, and, you know, about overcoming adversity or about being a better friend or about being a better student. Um, they can tell that story and share that story. Um, we, um, and then we, we hear from kids. We get a lot of kids asking us for that opportunity to share their story, to read other, other kids' stories. Um, and also it will help sustain engagement because as much as we love what's on Grid X, um, after you've done it a few times, um, it's, it's not going to be as novel or as interesting than you know it, but you, you may come, but you will come back for stories, uh, more stories for more skills. And you will come back when, uh, when you have a bot that will guide you through things too and, and surprise you. Like when, when people come, I believe this to be really true. When, when people um, come back to my office for a follow-up appointment, they're not coming because of my wonderfully charming personality. Um, they're coming because they think I'm going to say something, I'm going to ask a question or say something, make a comment that's going to get them, give them that aha moment. Ah, you're right. I should think, oh, I didn't see that connection before. And that's what they're coming for. So we will, we, we need to really build, build in the, to sustain engagement, something that's going to, a story you hear from someone else that you can relate to. Um, and as I said, a bot that will guide you through. Okay. Exactly. So in the way that our grid X provides psychoeducation, the other side of that coin is about building community because having a community is also a very integral part of the healing process. And so um, Mahima is going to talk about a little bit about her work and how they are building communities for healing. Yeah. Um, Did you want to say something? Go ahead. I'll, I'll say it a little bit. All right. Well, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking about one application of scalable therapeutics, um, which is the work that I do at Teatros. Um, and I'm going to walk you through um, what we do um, in terms of building communities, but also the kinds of information that we're giving out and how therapeutic it is um, for those communities to receive it. Um, so this morning, I think, Monica, you started us off by talking about the whole child and the emphasis on the whole child. There's no such thing as a whole child without taking into account the teachers, the staff, the support personnel, the resource specialists, the school psychologists, the administrators um, in that child's life. And so my experience um, as a clinical psychologist, I worked in um, the Oakland school-based um, psychotherapy services system for a number of years, mostly in elementary school um, with elementary school-age kids. And on the one hand, what I saw repeatedly was the work in the one-on-one -on -one model is extremely rewarding. It is really hard. The burnout is really high. And I loved every minute of it. But the most pr frustrating part of it was that we did not have equal number of services to actually match and provide the same level of support for the support community, which included teachers and school psychologists, et cetera. Um, and families too. So not every family actually enters the psychotherapy space, even if the child is in therapy. Can I just want to interject? Um, you mentioned diffic the difficulty of working with some of the kids, particularly, you know, kids, um, high-risk kids. And in my opinion, working with a high-risk youth who's at risk of suicide, of drug abuse, of violence, um, is extremely difficult. And to me, it's too much of a burden for any single therapist working on their own to handle on their own. Mm -hmm. So the therapists need a community as well. For those of you who are familiar with dialectic behavior therapy, DBT, which is an evidence-based therapy for kids who self-injure and make suicide attempts, uh, one of the contributions that Marshall, Martha Linehan, who developed this, uh, Marsha Linehan, who developed this, uh, created was the idea of a consultation team. So mm -hmm. therapists working with a child who's suicidal aren't out there all alone. You've got a group of other therapists to support each other around it. So again, I just want to say that the, com the, the importance of community extends to teachers, to school counselors, yes. to individual therapists, to school administrators, to all of us. Right. 
I mean, and the, even when there's desire to provide those services directly to those community members, I think scalability is an issue, right? We don't even have enough therapists to see the kids one-on-one. -on -one. So then this becomes, I don't know, a long, long dream maybe that, but it's realizable, I think, using scalable therapeutics, which is actually the work that Teatros is doing in um, collaboration with UCSF and our own technology platform that we've built. Um, I'm gonna spend just a couple of minutes on the importance of community. And one thing that I experienced as a therapist on site, um, a lot of times I thought actually just providing more support for a teacher in, the, in that classroom was sometimes even better intervention than just the one-on-one -on -one work, right? It's, when I say it, sometimes it feels provocative to some extent, but I've seen this happen where really providing support for the adult translates in a way that then the child's needs are kind of um, maybe more manageable. Um, and I read this study about the importance and the efficacy of book clubs and why book clubs are so popular and why people get together repeatedly to read together. It's actually not because of the content of what they're reading, but it's mostly the therapeutic effects of being in a group together, um, which keeps people from coming to it. So it's the same model. We're, I, I think as humans, and Dr. Norman spoke to this, we're designed to be in groups and we heal better in groups. And so when we come together with healing as a focus, um, the one-on-one -on -one model is fantastic, but we actually also need to be doing that in groups. Um, and that's the foundation of what we do at um, Teatros, which I'm gonna walk you through just our product itself in a minute. Which I think is very much in line with what you're building on Grutex to just exactly. to bring the uh, student groups together, right? Exactly. Um, so I think, I, I mean, I said a little bit already about the mental health um, needs in school that is they're not just student specific, but um, the whole community. I'm gonna skip over to um, the power of peer groups. And I'll say a little bit about the pilot that we just completed at the Novato um, School District. Um, and we had about nine, I think we had nine um, Novato School District staff participate in this pilot. Um, and most of them were either resource specialists or, or school psychologists, um, or also providing services one-on-one um, -on -one in the classroom, but from an outside agency. So this was the constellation of the group. Um, and we, what we did was we provided a platform for them to come online as a group and take our psychoeducation and resiliency program for a, a period of eight weeks. So it's an eight week program. And they logged in asynchronously on their own devices um, whenever it was convenient for them. But each week we had a specific module um, that spoke to resiliency, that gave them a lot of psychoeducation information, um, which was based on neurobiology, psychology, um, and actual skills. Um, and then they also completed narrative exercises, very similar to GridX, um, and then also CBT exercises. So it's about a 90 minute program a week um, for eight weeks, but they did this together as colleagues. Um, and I can't tell you how amazing it was to just see some of the ways that the narratives reflected um, their support for each other, their care and co concern for each other. Um, and also sadly, there was a high school student who committed suicide um, in the Novato district in the middle of our pilot. And it really helped them kind of get through. I mean, I, I think that's going to be a lifelong process, but having the support of each other in the way that they did on this platform was just um, really incredible. Let's see, I think, can I just click um, on the... Yeah, just, just leave it. Oh, okay. The Teatro's registration process is simple and only takes a few moments to complete. After following a link from its registration, staff is taken to the program registration landing page, where, if he had previously taken the Teatro's program, he could enter his login information. But because he is new to Teatro's, he will select a similar button. Here, he enters his name, preferred email address, desired password, and the voucher code he was given in the registration email he received.
after reviewing the Teatro's terms and conditions, he is prompted to enter a secure PIN number that was sent to the email address he provided. Just basically showing um, just a very simple way of just coming on uh, register yeah, and logging on. It's going to get into the content in a, in a second. Okay. That covers some of the following registration requirements and gives an overview of Teatros and the Teatros program experience. Next, Seth completes his profile by adding some information about himself, selects his preferred program start date, and adds an image for his profile picture. With that done, Seth is given to his Teatros dashboard. At the top of the screen, it lists his start date and how many days he has until the program begins. He can now explore the platform. Before his start date, Seth is expected to make his way through a series of validated clinical assessments and other introductory tasks that are placed on his dashboard that is used to help him track his progress in building greater emotional resilience. Once Seth has completed the introductory tasks, he will receive a reminder in the days before his program begins. The dash so I just wanted to um, give you a sense of what the platform itself looks like, but I'm going to just talk briefly about the various components in the program. So it's typically a five-step process each week. Um, the biggest focus that we have is on the resilience content. So we really try to capture based on every demographic that we're working with. So this is a program that we offer in schools, but we also offer it for um, employees in large Fortune 500 companies where they're really looking for building resilience. Um, we also offer it in the healthcare system for uh, patients with specific conditions. So the resilience discussions we can tailor to um, each of those demographics as needed. Um, did you want to add something? No, I just have, just, I think the, the purpose of the, this point is just to show using um, all of the tools of social media, it's easy to sign up, log on, and present, but I think we should go to the content of what we're actually teaching. Right. Um, so following the resilience um, discussion, which is all, you know, we do it online. So there's a video, you get the information. And then we move into the psychoeducation portion, which is very similar to the GRITX model. You saw all that content, but what we've done is uh, pared it down into a 10 minute video that's topic based for each week to really help folks understand, you know, why they may be having the feelings that they have, for example, or name the stressors. Um, and then there are exercises built in that you complete. And at the end of the week, you actually are paired up with someone else in your group where you give them feedback um, on whatever they've written for the week. Yeah, yeah. so it really employs the buddy system in terms of um, encouraging completion, uh, you know, compliance uh, with the program. You know, for as long as we've had the internet, there's been efforts um, to attain some skill using the internet and psychotherapies. Um, so one model of that you know, is sometimes referred to as just computer-assisted therapy, hmm. where instead of um, my seeing a patient for 20 sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety or depression, they could come and see me once. I'll give them an overview of what cognitive behavioral therapy is. Then over the next 20 weeks, um, we'll exchange emails. So there's some economy, uh, certainly for the patient, they don't have to drive in and out to the office, uh, but also the therapist will spend less, you know, a few minutes, you know, a week um, reviewing a thought and mood log rather than a full hour. So there's some economy of scale, but guess what? Uh, completion, the outcomes are just as good as the traditional one-on-one, -on -one, hour for hour in person. If you go to um, the ideal of something that's just open access, easily accessible, self-paced, so here's, I just give you a web address, go on, follow it, and you'll do fine. Those also work extremely well, have outcomes just as good um, as in-person therapies for the 2% or so of people who have the wherewithal to come on and do that on their own because most of us um, just don't have that ability. Mm -hmm. If you do something in between called guided self-help, where I'm gonna give you um, a website and you're gonna watch videos, do exercises, uh, and you can call me once a week, but I'm not going to talk to you. Uh, I'll talk to you for 15 minutes, but we're not going to talk about how's the family, how's the job. We're going to talk about where are you in, in the in the protocol. Mm -hmm. You did module one. What questions do you have about that? You're stuck in module two. How do we get you unstuck? So literally cheerleading you through. Then completion rates go um, immediately from 
few percent to around 50 percent. Mm -hmm. When you add to it a peer group, um, so that uh, the guide is not a therapist or a research associate that you talk to for 15 minutes a week, but rather um, a group of peers, then the completion rates go up to the 75%. And I think that's the importance of right. this approach. Um, would you, I'm gonna, can we move on to the slides? How do I get out of Just, this? Um, this? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Dr. Norman, maybe I can, I'm gonna um, just have you say a few things about um, the changes that we saw. Sure. Um, so again, um, the approach, and Mahim is uh, showing with a, a group of technology workers, adults, uh, I'll show you some data we have on working with uh, Afghan and uh, Iraq and Afghan war veterans um, with PTSD where we've applied this. So we take the, the best principles of the so-called flip-flop classroom. Do you guys know that concept? Like it's really applies kind of in colleges where um, if you go to a school like UC Berkeley, um, you're going to have classes that have 400 to 600 students in them. You can't even get a seat in the auditorium. Um, and if you are in, this, in the auditorium, you can't ask questions, you can't talk to your neighbors. So um, for that, you might as well watch that on a video because you're gonna, you know, not going to ask questions anyway. Come to class to ask questions, to talk about the impact of the lecture on me or to work out problems. Uh, we know there's some wonderful open source, uh, open access um, education programs like uh, Udacity and Coursera. Mm -hmm. uh, well, typically they'll um, have a worldwide, two and a half million people may sign up for a course in engineering, but only about one half of 1% actually do that first lesson. Still a lot of people, one half of 1% of two and a half million. But um, at some uh, colleges like at uh, San Jose State, they'll use the Coursera or Udacity content for the lecture material. But twice a week, you come to a small group discussion. And then the completion rates are up to the 80 to 90 percent, like they is typical of their of, of their college courses. Um, so we want to use that same principle: watch these videos that are engaging, compelling, do personal exercises, mindfulness meditation, journal writing, then come online for facilitated discussion. In uh, working in with a um, population of technology workers, what we've been astonished by is the levels of anxiety, depression, <laughs> and stress. I mean, a lot of, a lot of those jobs are um, you know, very uh, high stress. They work hard, they play hard, uh, and they're anxious and they're depressed and they drink too much and they have other, other kinds of issues. So um, we taught the resiliency um, program in our pilot and we looked first at perceived stress. But, and what that scale is, uh, your job is stressful, all of you have stress, you have high stress jobs. But the question is, do you feel that stress is manageable? Do you mm -hmm. feel like you're on top of it? Or you're at a point where I can't manage it, there's too many tasks, too much things going on. And so um, if your perceived stress, stress scale is high, you're saying your stress level is, you're overwhelmed by it. And that also correlates very highly with a lot of somatic symptoms, headaches, backaches, trouble sleeping, um, stomach aches, mm -hmm. uh, more visits uh, to doctors. So, so the first scale um, that was measured was perceived stress, and you can see the, <laughs> the significant declines. Um, go ahead. Uh, exactly. Same for uh, anxiety. This is uh, G87, it's seven questions for, about anxiety, and you can also see the significant drops. Uh, same for depression. And then same for somatization. Um, and this one? Um, okay, go back, yeah. So um, in a scale um, like this, you, see, you can certainly see graphically the drops. We also, in doing the statistical analyses, uh, the probabilities of this just being a random chance event um, is always less than 0.05. Uh, most of the time it's less than 0.01, meaning, the chance that this was just random that the, you threw the, you know, you threw the cards on the stairs and how do they line up is less than 1%, one percent, one out of 100 chance. Uh, we also look at effect size, um, and what that means is there may be we may see a change, but does it really matter? So let me give us a, a simple example of that would be if I wanted to do a study of our Italian men taller than Spanish men. I actually don't know the answer to that. I think they're probably about the same. Um, but I probably would need lots and lots of Italian men, lots and lots of 
Spanish men. And if there's a difference, maybe it's an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch. But let's say I did a study of our NBA basketball players taller than professional racehorse jockeys. Don't need very many to find out that they're a foot and a half taller um, in, in the NBA. Uh, and also, it's very meaningful. NBA players are incredible athletes. They wouldn't make very good racehorse jockeys. And same for racehorse jockeys are great athletes, but they're not going to they're not going to do a slam dunk. So, so what, what effect size measures? If you have a large effect size, it means that not only was um, there a statistical improvement, um, but we can see that the impact was large. And so we want to see effect sizes at least of 0.5, um, but uh, at, uh, at point, point 0.8 is strong, one is very strong, and so on. So all of the effect sizes here varied between 0.8 and 1.3, I think. 1.3, that's Yeah, so meaning you know, very, that these were not only um, statistically not random, but also they made a big impact on those, um, those presentations. And the Novato pilot, um, we're just still collecting some of this post data. And so I don't have the data to share with you, but it's very similar mm -hmm. in profile. Okay. All right. And I think you're going to, do you want to step um, back this is where Dr. Okay, I can go into this. Um, um, I can help you. Yeah. Okay. Um, in um, Presenting uh, these courses, and we, I'll show you some data that we have on using it with um, war veterans in a moment. In addition to these structured questionnaires like depression and anxiety and stress level, we also wanted to apply natural language um, analytics, um, looking at what people are writing about, what's the emotional tone, what does that tell us? Because honestly, checklists don't tell stories, stories tell stories. Um, you know, a personal example of that, uh, my wife and I raised four children, two boys and two girls, or two older children of boys. They were 20 and 18 on 9-11, and each of them decided they wanted to do their part uh, to join the global war on terror. So our older son joined the army, uh, spent six years in the army, including two tours in Iraq. Our younger son joined the Navy and spent six years on um, the nuclear submarine in the USS uh, Connecticut. By the way, if you if you Google Connecticut and uh, if you if you Google submarine and polar bear, my son's uh, submarine pops up because they surfaced at the North Pole and a polar bear came and took a bite out of the rudder. Um, that has nothing to do with this presentation today, but I just wanted to hear that story. Um, when our older son, who did two tours in Iraq, came home, the first thing my wife noticed about him was um, she said, you know, he doesn't say life isn't fair anymore. And he didn't say it all the time, but like when he applied for college and he didn't make Stanford, he, he, he didn't make Cal and he went to Cal, a great school. But his best friend, who wasn't nearly as good a student, but his father was a major donor to Stanford, made Stanford, he said, life isn't fair. But after... Um, coming out of Iraq, where he went over with a battalion of 700 men and women, and six did not come home. He doesn't say life isn't fair. He says, life gives you opportunity. It's your responsibility to make the most of your opportunity. That's an example of post-traumatic growth. I, I, I looked at 35 standardized questionnaires for measuring post-traumatic growth. I didn't find a single one that came close to that, uh, that question. The, the closest thing was, since your traumatic event, do you handle conflict differently? So um, sometimes you can really only get where a person is by hearing their stories, hearing what they're, what they're saying. Um, and now um, many of you have seen, I'm sure, television commercials of uh, Watson, IBM Watson's um, computer mm -hmm. talking to Bob Dylan or talking to Stephen King, and that we have the, com the, the algorithms have existed since the 1940s, but we've only had powerful enough computing to go through so many words and, and figure out the meaning and phrases. So we applied uh, natural language analytics um, uh, using IBM Watson's um, personality insights and uh, tone analyses. And we used uh, Jamie Pennebaker, remember Jamie Pennebaker from the journaling, who has also a natural language analytic um, tool called the Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count. The next slide. Yeah. Um, we've had a, a few questions online. Sure. I just wanted to clarify something. We've invited um, TI shows to be here today because their great team has been involved in um, compiling and reporting on the data from the pilot studies um, for GridX. 
Um, it is a separate program or service, and there is a cost associated with that. Just want to make that clear. And it's necessarily um, here to present a product so much as it is as the other team that's been involved and helping report on some of this data from some of the good things they found yeah. with GridX. So just wanted to interject that. Real Thank quick. you for doing that. Yeah, this is, is, is um, Chatros has been um, our technology collaborator to be able to present um, our coursework online because it has to be done uh, in a HIPAA compliant environment, has to be done with ease of use. So they're our technology um, collaborator. Um, so what, um, can we go the, down, down a little bit further? Yeah, I want to go down to my data. This is, that's your data. Okay, so um, looking at um, using this is uh, from IBM's tone analyzer. Tone analyzer just looks at the sentiment. Is it is there a lot of fear, sadness, anger, disgust? And here um, with our program called Next Mission, which is the program for combat veterans, um, you can see that um, the yellow joy is relatively small and look how much joy has gone up. Um, sadness goes down really significantly disgust goes down. Mm -hmm. A lot of combat veterans um, have um, this, you know, post-traumatic stress. Sometimes we talk about the invisible wounds, the invisible injuries, but also we hear a lot of talk about moral injuries where um, what was I doing there? I fired um, on a, car that ran past a checkpoint thinking it was a terrorist when it was a man with his pregnant wife rushing to the hospital um, and overcoming that kind of trauma where I've done collateral damage is really, really hard. So there's um, sometimes very high levels of disgust about what we were doing, what, why was I there? And um, But we found in the course, disgust went down, joy went up, sadness went down, joy went up, fear went down, joy went up. Um, so I don't expect you to be able to read this slide, but... Um, we used um, the personality insight, which looks at the so-called big five. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the big five in personality, uh, OCEAN is the acronym. O is for openness, C is for conscientiousness, E is for extroversion, A is for agreeability, and N is called for neuroticism. Now we call it emotional range. Um, so, there's a little bit of a dialectic. Openness is a good thing, but not necessarily always a good thing. We wanna be open to take a new course, take on a new challenge, being open to trying a new drug. I mean, that's not a, we don't wanna be as open to that. So you have to, you have to look more carefully than just broadly openness. Um, conscientiousness, interestingly, went down in our study, um, which we take as actually a positive because one of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder is hypervigilance. You're on guard, you're vigilant, um, you're not trusting, you're very conscientious of the environment. You feel a little better, you can relax a little bit more. Um, but we found that um, agreeableness um, went up, conscientiousness went down, openness went up. Also, um, looking at values, we found that the valuing love and connectedness to others increased uh, during the course. Uh, what we also found is using the language, uh, linguistic inquiry and word count was that authenticity went way up. So this is looking at words and phrases that demonstrate you're really digging deep and being open and honest and personal, and that improved in the course. And as I told you earlier, uh, time and time again, people tell us we're much more open online than we are in person. And here's a, um, a measure of that. Uh, also confidence. Uh, went up in terms of using words that um, that show that I'm I feel I have some power some clout um, and confidence in my speaking those scores went up so um, so what we really um, believe is that looking at the using natural and ang language analytic tools can help us track progress sometimes way better than um, a simple uh, you know uh, anxiety scale or, de or depression scale, so we can track the storytelling for tone. We also believe this is going to really help us at scale as we want to track things like is somebody becoming more at risk in terms of um, uh, suicidality or potential um, committing an act of violence. We'll be able to, you know, um, track large numbers of people. I would say, like, um, if I teach a seminar with 10 students, I can read all their papers. If I teach a lecture class with 200 students, I need 10 teaching assistants. 
right? So the, these powerful tools become teaching assistants for all of us because they can scan through literally millions of pages of, of text um, and, um, and then give us reports on, is it a lot of fear, a lot of sadness, a lot of anger, is hope going up or going down? Um, and then we'll, we'll enable us, uh, as we go to a larger and larger scale, identify people who are at mo most risk that we need to, to intervene with. Um, so yeah, I just want to thank you guys um, for listening to our presentation. It was a really great opportunity just to share our work on scalable therapeutics. At this time, um, we'll take any comments or questions you guys may have. I have a couple questions from our, um, Please. our task attendees. Number one, is there an informed consent for GridX? By that. And number two, is there any kind of introduction video or anything that um, school clinicians can show their students as they're just getting onto the site and how to navigate? Uh, regarding um, informed consent, um, this um, it's an open access uh, website, so you don't need any, you don't have to consent to anything. We do, um, when you come on the first time, we'll ask you to accept the term. It, it, it explains the privacy policy uh, and all. Um, we are going, as we study the pilots in Novato and Santa Ana and any other groups that are willing to pilot with us, we will ask informed consent from parents if the kids, if they're under 18, we need parental consent uh, for us to track them, how often they're coming on, what aspects, uh, what skills they're working on, and we will ask them to complete some surveys on how they're doing, whether they're finding this useful, how they may be benefiting, and that would be, that's definitely would be require an informed consent. Um, and as, uh, in regards to an uh, um, introductory explanatory uh, video, great idea, wish I'd thought of it, but we're gonna get started on it. <laughs> that's a great idea, we should have one. I have another if others are in the room. Uh, webcast attendee had asked, um, could you share a little bit about where to access some of the articles of the studies showing the effectiveness from the GridX pilot? So we have um, a couple of studies that are in press. Um, we should post them um, for you. If anybody um, can email me directly. I'll send. I'll send them the data. We we um, are in the on the process of publishing that data right now, uh, but happy to share it with anybody who uh, who asks. Can we show the contact information for uh, yeah. here for the. I think it might be the next slide. Do we have um, So do we have any more questions? Is that going to be it? Um, so like the if we wanted to pilot in our school, we would contact one of you just Absolutely, yeah. we'd love to work with you. Um, you know, hand in hand, and um, as I said, anybody can and can just go on and show it to their students or whatever, but it would be fantastic if we did it more systematically so we can actually follow some of the students and see how they're doing. And um, so contact uh, me and, um, and we'll meet, and we'll come out to you wherever you are in California, because, uh, you know, having a meeting with the, you know, the counselors in person um, and teachers to show them this and walk you through and to do all the things that will appear in that introductory video that we're gonna make, uh, we would do in person and um, be able to be with you the whole way through. But that'd be great. And we're also gonna send a feedback form to everyone that's attend. So you guys could give your feedback and also if you wanna reach out about potential collaborations, we could go that way that too. So we've heard, or go ahead. Uh, the number when she talks about having uh, research or using students, do you have a number in mind, like 10 kids or is it like 500 kids? Well, you know, the more, uh, uh, I think we'd probably want to have a minimum um, of at least 20 kids, if I ideally, but um, but we'll do it, you know, we'll 
however many we have, I think to start to get something meaningful, you have to have at least four or five. But um, but ideally, um, ideally we'd have a hundred kids, um, and ideally we'd get a great um, gender mix, ethnic mix, uh, mix, uh, sexual orientation mix. The the more diverse, the the larger the numbers, the more diverse the backgrounds, the the better we'll be able to tell whether we're doing anything useful and where we need to change, you know, to become more useful. If there is a district that's interested in piloting the MigrantX mm -hmm. with the tracking enabled, um, do you have an idea of what might be an associated cost with that? Who would be the best person to contact? Um, so for MigrantX, um, the associated cost, we like to work in round numbers, is zero. <laughs> <laughs> so this, is, this, this is developed to be, we just want to help people. Um, there, uh, so, um, and we would happily, you know, with um, a philanthropic funds that we've raised at UCSF would cover the cost of my or my team coming out to do a, an assembly to teach it and all of that. But the, 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 this is a free of charge, absolutely available to anybody, anywhere, anytime service. When you um, present, build a course where we're going to have a community and we have a professional facilitator, <laughs> then there, there's a cost associated with that kind of course intervention, but um, but for this, there's no cost. That's great. It seems like many of the webcast attendees thought the GridX is free of charge, but the MigrantX is something more. No, 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 no. news to know that they're both free of thank charge. You for, thank you for clarifying that. MigrantX, when we start, we first got started with GridX, we were 100% um, focused on privacy, and we didn't even want to touch any personal health information. Um, as this has taken us some time to develop and the world has changed a bit, we realize that people are trusting of, um, of apps that they have control over that are that where we can guarantee the privacy of the app and that people do want to have the ability to come back and, and you know, pick up where they left off. Um, and so um, the MigrantX would just be um, your, personal, your personal space, but also a free service um, of, that will be available in August. Okay, well, I think that should do it. Can we please give a... Uh, Thank, you. Thank you. On behalf yeah. of our team and Wellness Together School Mental Health, our partners, the California Department of Education, and UCSF and GridX. Thank you so much for being a part of this, both online and here. I think for, for those that are here in person here in Rockland, you guys will be here and treating everyone to lunch, is what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. We'll be Thank here just for a few minutes and uh, enjoy the weekend. For many of you, enjoy your break. I'm so sorry.